of the live. Okay, I, I it seems that it started right now to record. So hello again, and then welcome to everyone to the third day of this live online lecture to mark the 40th anniversary of the IGS. My name is Laura Carbona and I am the Secretary General of the IGS. Today, I have the honor to introduce Ms. Jabulile Mziza lecture. Jabulile is the chairman of the Johnson Wagner Engineering and Environmental Consultant Boards of Directors, where she also heads the dynamic teams of engineers in the waste engineering department, serving waste management facilities across South Africa and other African regions. With 18 years working experience, more than 13 years as a registered professional engineer, she's passionate about design for environmental protection, particularly for waste management facilities, construction of barrier and capping systems, and promoting the understanding and appropriate use of geosynthetic materials. Jabulile graduated from the University of Pretoria in South Africa with Bachelor of Engineering in Civil Engineering in 2005, uh, Honours in Geotechnical Engineering in 2008, and the Honours in Environmental Engineering in 2009, and uh, also had UP and MBA through the University of Reading's Henley Business School in 2018. Dabulili is a member of South Africa Institute of Civil Engineers, South African chapter of the International Geosynthetic Society, and the Institute of Waste Management, South Africa, and serves on board of Consulting Engineering South Africa, where she chairs the Transformation Development Committee. She is also a council member of the International Geosynthetic Society, vice chair of the IGS Technical Committee on Barriers, and chairs uh, of the African and Middle East Regional Activity Committee of the IGS. Today, Jabulili will talk about uh, African studies and opportunities. And uh, please note that today's event will be recorded so that we can share with members who were unable to make it uh, to the live session. If you have any questions or comment, please use the Q&A function so uh, we will ask the question to Jabulili at the end of her presentation. So now I think the introduction is done. Jabulili, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lara. Thanks for that introduction. Greetings to everyone all over the world, wherever you are, morning, night. I just wanna say thank you very much for making time to join this lecture today on African case studies. It's a celebration time in terms of the anniversary um, of the International Geosynthetic Society. And it's a celebration of what Africa has achieved over the past 40 years. I'd also like to say thank you to all those in the African region who have contributed um, some of these case studies that I will be presenting today. So let's start with a personal matter, I would say. They say never ask a lady her age, but I'm actually quite comfortable in stating that I turned 40 this year together with the IGS. And it's been a time of reflection and I thought I'd draw some parallels with my turning 40, as well as an organization like the IGS turning 40. So um, on the left you see there in terms of personal journey, um, it is a significant milestone into middle age. Um, and for an organization like this, I guess it symbolizes its maturity. Um, it symbolizes that it's not in the embryonic stage anymore um, and is, is, is fully maturing and has staying power. For myself, there's been really a deeper understanding of myself, my capabilities, um, greater confidence in what I'm capable of, and um, self-assuredness. And I think with um, the IGS as well, over the 40 years, um, in terms of um, engaging with its members, engaging um, with all the different regions all over the world, has a better understanding of the needs um, and, and, and what it can benefit um, its um, members. It's also a time of reassessment of priorities um, 
you know, you reflect back over the past 40 years and what you've achieved, what has worked and what has not worked, um, and set goals for the future. And the IGS has been through a similar journey in terms of reviewing operational guidelines, bylaws, strategy, rebranding. Um, so it's, it's, it's also been a time with change of leadership, especially this year, um, in terms of looking what are the benefits and are we serving um, the geosynthetic community. And lastly, it's a time of shaping the next phase of life's direction. You know, they say life begins at 40 and, you know, it sounds cliche, but you only understand it when you get there. And same with the IGS, um, is focus on creating lasting tools and materials that will help the industry move forward. Um, this in the form of um, the handbook that is being developed, um, the sustainability calculator, the library. So um, just, just making sure that the next 40 years um, will um, be as beneficial um, as the past has been. So moving on in terms of um, the growth of the African um, region over the past 40 years, um, there's definitely been um, more adoption and use of geosynthetic materials um, in design. So this, this has led to quite a transformation in the construction and um, engineering sectors in that traditional materials where not suitable or available have been replaced with geosynthetic materials um, that can provide equivalent and sometimes um, even more superior performance. There's been a growth in manufacturing and distribution of materials. Um, I will share some 2K studies in terms of um, manufacturer, manufacturers that have arisen um, in the SADC region um, over the past um, few years. But in terms of distribution as well, um, quite a lot of manufacturers have presence in African countries more than before. Not only are we looking at growing the use of um, geosynthetic materials, but what's important is growing the appropriate use. So um, a clear understanding of the materials, uh, as well as how when they interact with soils, interact with other structures, how they behave. Um, and a bigger drive now is how durable the materials are um, you know, will a liner last forever? Will a grid be able to support the structure for its lifetime? So growing use and, and, and understanding and education um, and, and case studies um, as we learn more and, and use the materials more. Um, Jorge gave a, a good talk um, on, on, on Monday in terms of um, education um, in, in, in the geosynthetic industry. And he ended with a quote that said, um, it, it was from um, the founding um, father of, of the society, J.P. Giroux, in that when we understand um, geosynthetics, we actually end up understanding soils more. Um, there's just so much value in terms of um, education around how these materials function um, and, and, and how they can be appropriately used. And there's a lot of effort in terms of webinars and technical committees, um, as well as um, educate the educators type of programs that ensure that the education um, of geosynthetics um, is shared worldwide, worldwide. In Africa, the same has been, um, even with um, growth in regulations. Um, a good example is how our waste um, standards um, in terms of lining standards for appropriate containment of waste um, have developed over 1994 to where we sit now in terms of one of the most superior standards um, as recorded in that um, um, study we've done in terms of worldwide standards and also standard, standardization, not only in barrier systems, but um, in um, geotextiles and geogrids um, and in all other spheres of um, geosynthetic materials, growing standards that can assist the design engineer and also the installer in terms of how to appropriately um, install these products. There's been growth in Africa in terms of chapter formation. 
Um, the earliest chapter was formed in 1994 in South Africa. And um, since then, there's been um, chapters formed in Ghana um, in 2012, followed by a chapter in Morocco in 2014, um, and Egypt being the youngest of the chapters in the African region. There has been effort to establish others, but there has been other organizational challenges um, in terms of expanding chapters. But there is plans to conduct ambassadors programs and relook at the chapter formation and see if certain regions can group together in terms of making bigger impact. Africa has also had the privilege of hosting some regional um, conferences with the first Geo Africa starting in Cape Town in 2009, um, followed by um, another successful conference in Accra in 2013, Marrakesh in 2017, and most recent in February this year, the Egyptians um, hosted a very successful Geo Africa conference. All of this, again, as I said, it's to celebrate the progress that has been made in the African region in terms of growing um, in, in, in all areas, not just um, use of product, but um, education as well as um, advocacy. I mentioned earlier um, in terms of manufacturing, and this is one of the game changers um, that um, changed the, 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 especially in the SADC region, um, in, in, in terms of founding a, man, a, a geo membrane manufacturer in, in, in the southern region of Africa. So AKS Lining Systems was founded in 2002, actually, but at that stage, it was mostly um, focused on manufacturing a concrete protection liner product. Um, anchor knob sheeting. And only then in 2014 that they established their first um, wide flat die extrusion plant, which is the first for the African region, quite a milestone and, and, and a big achievement um, that is to be noted in the history of development in Africa. Since then, um, the uh, plant has expanded and now has um, three um, wide machines offering full range of geomembrane options, mostly for sub-Saharan sub African regions um, and beyond, and currently supplies approximately 1.5 million square meters of liner per month. So, um, like I said, in terms of availability of material, um, shortening lead time, um, being able to have a manufacturer in the region that you are able um, quickly pop into and, and, and get the experience of seeing material produced and tested, um, this has been quite a milestone for the African region. I must also state um, in terms of the GCL manufacturing line, um, in, 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 in the past 40 years, it's been a, a huge achievement um, of Africa in that um, in Atlantis and the Cape, there's been the establishment of the KTEC um, geosynthetic clay liner line. Um, and this again has expanded from what previously was just a, a geotextile manufacturing line um, to now serving the region of Africa and, and, and beyond um, in terms of a wide range um, of geosynthetic products. And the picture you see here is um, one of the power um, stations in South Africa, um, uh, uh, one of the national key points. And the installation of a GCL here, um, over 1 million square, square meters um, of area, had a significant time and cost saving um, in terms of preparing this ash disposal facility um, in time and at minimum cost to be able to continue with the power generation. You will all um, be aware of some of the power generation issues we have um, in the region. So now I will go into specific um, construction and um, monitoring case studies. And again, I must say, um, if, if time was not limited, we could be able to share way more than this. But these case studies um, are what have been submitted by some of the regions, and they don't um, fully encompass um, all the different regions in which 
um, geosynthetic materials are being installed in Africa. So I, will, I won't go through the list now as I'm gonna be going through all of them um, as we proceed. So I thought to start with this case study um, supplied by Calvin Legg. Um, those of you who attended GeoAfrica in Cairo would know that um, for the first time we had a, a named lecture series um, after Calvin Legg, um, and this was presented by Peter Legg for the first time um, ever. So um, this is a case that I'd just like to acknowledge him um, in providing this case study. So this is um, on Verwacht um, reservoirs in South Africa. And um, it's important that we start with a case that is over 40 years old, because it's also one of the only durability case studies that we have in this presentation. Um, so the Department of Water and Sanitation has been monitoring these dams over the past 40 years. Um, initially built in the 1960s and started off as clay dams. Um, and that was not good enough as too much water was being lost um, to um, seepage. And these dams are quite significant in that they provided water to over five power stations at that time. And so um, water retention was a priority. And then um, there was then um, lining in terms of a, a butyl rubber liner in the first um, dams 1A and B, which is um, in the foreground the first two that you see, um, but also that um, suffered some degradation and damage. This was at a time when HDPE liner was not available um, as it is right now. Um, and, and part of the solutions then was to concrete line the dams. Um, but again, with the concrete line at that stage, um, the, the, the joint sealant that was used in between the panels um, ended up failing, which led to um, quite an interesting case study in terms of future joints um, in concrete line facilities um, in, 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 in terms of the filler material that is used. So the concrete line um, um, had a, a, a failure of the sealant and ultimately the relining um, was with HDPE and also one of the first reported use um, of the um, wedge welder in, in, in South Africa. So it's just some of the photos again um, of this facility um, focusing on the wells. What you'll see on the left there is um, initially before wedge welding um, technology was being used, these were extrusion welded. And due to, <clears throat> due to um, overgrind on the two panels um, that were being welded together, you notice there that there is a failure of the seam on both sides of the weld. Um, and so these welds um, were, were, were deemed to have failed. I mean, you can see on the left is just a um, downslope view. Um, and then on the right is a side slope view of the same seam. Um, and then um, on the right is ultimately um, the development then in terms of constructing these dams uh, with the wedge welder. To this day, um, these are accessible. Um, the department continues to, to monitor them. Um, and I think there'll be even um, more case um, studies that come from this in terms of the durability of the material under these exposed conditions. Next case study I'd like to present is that of a development um, of a tailings facility in Ghana, um, one of the largest um, in the history. So this facility has um, capa capacity of 60 million um, metric tons with an area of approximately 575 square meters. So quite a significant um, structure um, in, in, in terms of the construction um, requirements there. You'll see the outer wall is um, created out of um, rock, and that is due to the availability um, of rock at this particular mine, but also that created challenges in terms of um, the, the, the inner embankment and having a surface there that could be prepared um, to be acceptable for, for liner placement. Overall, um, it has gone pretty well. 
um, preparation has enabled successful um, installation of a single composite barrier system with some below and above liner drains. And the cell, the, the facility has been part commissioned um, while the northern um, side of the facility continues um, to be constructed. This is just a view showing um, the northern um, portion of the tailings facility under um, construction. I would like then to move on to the next um, case study, um, similar scale. This is a fine ash dam construction um, in South Africa. Again, another one of its kind in terms of being one of the largest ever um, fine ash disposal facilities to be lined um, according to the requirement of the regula regulations in terms of um, limiting infiltration into sensitive um, groundwater resources. So this fine ash dam has been um, developed to be able um, to um, continue the operations um, of this particular facility um, in terms of ash disposal at a rate of 317,000 tons per month. It was commissioned um, in 2019, and that is just only the first phase of it. Um, there is planned expansion of this, um, and the first phase can accommodate almost 45 million um, cubic um, meters um, of fine ash. Again, a single composite liner that's got under drains to monitor the performance of the single barrier. And you can imagine um, traditionally these fine ash dams as well as the tailings facilities um, have relied a lot of, on infiltration in terms of being able to drain um, and control phreatic head within these facilities, which is um, an, an important factor to consider for slope stability. Um, so with lining these facilities, the above liner drainage um, systems um, are of critical importance in terms of being able to drain. Again, they're quite an extensive use of geotextiles um, and, and piping systems um, in order to, 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 to give sufficient drainage to allow for consolidation um, of this fine ash that is placed um, and ensure stability. As part of this construction, there was also a return water dam um, that was um, constructed with over 800,000 cubes of storage capacity. All in all, this first phase of the facility has had 675,000 square meters of liner installed. The next case is one of the South African chapters um, award winners um, last year. And this is a hazardous landfill facility, again in South Africa, where um, a double composite liner system has been installed. Um, I think what is unique with regards to this facility is that it piggybacked over um, old disposal areas that had um, different or um, incompetent liner um, per se in terms of legacy um, construction. So with the extension of this particular cell, it was important to then piggyback in terms of capping um, those um, older cells um, and creating their new capacity above that to continue landfilling. So for this design, um, there was um, quite a lot of um, extensive use of geosynthetic materials to ensure a fully um, functioning barrier system um, as a whole rather than um, um, individual, individual layers um, performing the individual tasks. For example, um, there's um, a lot of use of geogrid um, in terms of basal um, preparation and reinforcement, and also use of geogrid above the primary liner um, to take care of the um, stone layer, stone collection layer placement on the slope um, to prevent excessive strain formation um, on that primary liner, which should not be acting in tension. Um, so quite um, a significant use of materials. Um, in this picture, you'll see almost all the um, um, various components of the lining system being installed at once, and again, showing quite um, significant use of geotextiles, um, geomembranes, um, and geogrid. 
I think um, one of the other interesting things with this um, piggyback liner is um, I think we'll all appreciate joining um, GeoGrid um, on a very long slope where you are meant to be um, reinforcing that requires quite some intrinsic um, jointing methods. Um, and here there was a requirement of a 12 meter, 12 meter wide intermediate bench um, or anchor trench that would be able um, to transfer the load between the two layers um, that are being jointed. Now moving on to the next case study, um, and here um, I think what is most important is just to celebrate and appreciate just the, the level of um, construction quality and complex geometry um, with steep slopes um, lining. This, there'll always be such a challenge um, in terms of some of the geological settings um, which have to be developed on. And um, there's been quite a, a lot of case um, studies also in the valleys um, of the KZN um, region of South Africa, for example, um, of steep slope lining systems. So here it's the installation of waterproofing um, at the Safi um, thermal power plant in Morocco. Um, again, um, it looks like it's an extreme sport there um, in terms of placement of the panels. And um, you, you can imagine with welding of these, um, running a welder at sufficient speed and pressure um, while gravity is really working in your favor, in, in, in terms of ensuring a good quality weld while maintaining safety standards. So this case is just to appreciate um, progress in terms of um, capability um, in complex um, liner installations. Another case study um, from Morocco is um, the rehabilitation and closure um, of this um, regional landfill site. And depending on each region, um, the use of um, geosynthetic materials and final capping system is again um, increasing because they can provide quite um, a few benefits over um, natural materials in terms of um, place, speeding up placement um, of, 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 of drainage layers. For example, in a, in a typical capping system, there would be the, the, the capillary break or the seepage co collector beneath the top barrier. And above that um, could be drainage um, in terms of um, draining the final cover layer to ensure veneer stability above that. Um, the barrier function here, you can see, um, is with a textured geomembrane that has been installed. Um, and also some protection geotextiles that have been employed in terms of preventing puncture from both um, beneath and above the geomembrane. So in this capping system, almost five layers of geosynthetic um, materials, making sure that there is a capping system that is sustainable and resilient um, for the future. So this wraps up um, the case studies um, showcasing the um, barrier um, containment use in Africa. I would also like to then present a few case studies um, to do with ground improvement, flood protection, erosion protection. Um, and I'll start off with um, Morocco's first high-speed railway line. Um, this case study shows the the, the, the railway line um, that was um, to link two major cities in terms of Casablanca um, and, and, and Tangier. And it is a 200 kilometer long line um, that was inaugurated um, in uh, about um, five years ago now. So um, celebrating also its um, milestone um, um, existence. So with this one, the, the, the complexity came about in terms of um, construction over compressible um, soil. Um, so you would imagine when there is um, soft soils underneath such a dynamic um, loading scenario, 
um, the significant um, settlement could result in um, some catastrophic um, failure um, and lives are at stake um, in terms of um, prioritizing just the stability um, and safe transport um, of this um, major line. So um, to overcome the challenge of the soft founding layer, um, there was use of prefabricated vertical drains um, because um, the geotechnical investigation showed that the soft soils um, can be as deep as 40 meters long. Um, again, um, if these are not properly consolidated, it could lead to some serious movement. Um, and so it was necessary to speed up that consolidation by um, using a combination of some preloading um, to give effect to some of these PBDs um, and also to, to, to reduce the consolidation time, which um, is reported to have done that um, by more than 50, 60% um, if only traditional measures were to be used. Um, and, and based on the numerical um, analyses that was done here, um, the um, effect of these prefabricated vertical drains um, reduced sub sub substantially um, the, the um, embankment fill that was required um, and also speeded up um, the construction um, of this railway um, line embankment. To move on then to the next case study, this is the first ever application of use of geofoam um, in South Africa. Um, again, another site overlain or underlain by soft and compressible low strength clays um, and silts, which are prone to settle over time because of the sensitive nature of the site, um, including a pipeline of, of, of national significance running through here, um, as well as um, other um, proximity to um, um, infrastructure. The, the option of completely removing the unsuitable material and maybe replacing um, with rock fill or other important um, or, or imported materials was not feasible. So this is a product that showcases new knowledge um, and in innovation in engineering um, and construction. Again, showing collaboration between um, different um, engineering teams in order to come up with a solution. So um, <clears throat> the, the, the ultimate solution in dealing with the soft um, um, found, founding condition was to use the expanded polystyrene geofoam as full below the road um, and to be able to then take the loading um, of the uh, platform and storage area that was to be placed um, over um, this area. So um, just a few photos in terms of um, the construction that happened. So over the, um, the, the, the platform area and the road, there was also use of geocells um, coupled with um, customers Gabion retaining walls just to, um, to, to provide a cost-effective um, solution that was optimized for the site boundary conditions. Um, and again, to provide a solution um, that would um, not settle over time and put pressure um, on this um, pipeline of significant importance. So um, yeah, so this 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 was quite an interesting case study, um, and I'm, I'm not aware of any other um, case where polystyrene or geofoam um, has been used as full um, in the African region, um, apart from this one. To just showcase another case study, this is a photo that I took um, during a site visit. Um, with the Geo Africa Conference, one of the um, days we had a um, site tour, a technical tour, and it was quite um, mind blowing to see all the, the development happening in the new Cairo city development, um, extensive use of geo grids, um, again, to provide um, sustainable and stable um, safe platforms for high-speed rail 
um, way um, formation as well as road networks. Um, so we visited the site and um, there is, um, I think it doesn't show in this picture, all the other embankments and use of um, retaining walls um, in order to create um, these um, networks. So just a, just a quick one um, to, to showcase Egypt as well. The other um, case study is to do with flood protection. I think we know with um, the climate changes as well as with um, large scale development and open areas um, and increased um, flood risk, the importance um, of putting some flood um, protection, especially in, in, in the particularly prone areas. Um, this here shows use of over 150,000 square meters um, of geotextile and geocells um, that are concrete filled um, that would take, um, that, that would have capacity um, to protect the city um, of Ojda um, of the potential flood risk. Um, so um, I, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to see the scale, but um, I think um, if you can see the height of a person there and you can see the size of this facility and the significance of it, um, it, it, it shows just the level of risk um, that is being mitigated um, with this structure. And so um, I'd like to end off with um, summarizing some of these case studies um, and highlighting um, from them in terms of regional um, opportunities in South Africa. There still continues to be quite a lot of infrastructure development. Um, and this is um, over some challenging subgrades, such as expansive soils, as I've shown, um, and traditional um, remove and replace practices might not be feasible. Some of these um, areas, um, number one, there would not be option for disposal of um, the spoiled material. Number two, um, bringing in um, material um, is, 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 is almost impossible in terms of being able to source suitable materials. And so there's definitely potential um, for more geosynthetic um, use of stabilizing um, the um, grounds um, where future development uh, would be taking place. Um, another opportunity is just managing water for sustainable agriculture. Um, and I'm taking this far as far as saying that this has to do with food security as well, um, because water, there's the this, this serious water scarcity in some African regions. And so um, losing water to seepage and even evaporation um, at times um, is to be prevented as best as possible because, um, you know, there's, there's, there's been that saying, but it's disputed that the next world war would be fought over water, but there are signs that water scarcity is becoming um, an, an increasing problem. Also linked with uh, managing water is protection um, of, um, sorry, that should not be scarce, but scarce water resources. Um, an example here would be responsible mining um, that prevents contamination um, of important groundwater um, sources and um, also responsible um, rehabilitation um, of either mines and landfills so that um, runoff from such facilities doesn't continue um, to cause harm to receiving environments. Um, there is potential use of geosynthetics in managing contaminated groundwater plumes that have been identified um, and controlling the spread of these. We've spoken about flood protection and the severity of flood impacts due to climate change. Rehabilitation of closed mines is quite a lot in Africa. Um, that need to be rehabilitated um, and um, opening land um, for other um, sustainable use rather than um, sterilizing it, um, as well as um, responsible um, farming or um, agricultural practices in terms of rehabilitation of irrigation canals. So then some closing remarks. 
Um, I'd like to confirm that with some of these case studies that we have presented, um, there is um, a clear um, evidence of more extensive use of geosynthetic solutions in Africa, um, that there is growing awareness of the materials and their benefits um, and being included um, as alternatives in more traditional um, engineering um, specifications. Um, that the significant role of geosynthetics in addressing um, the critical um, engineering and environmental challenges of Africa have been demonstrated, that the African region continues um, to grow um, in research and development um, and um, local production of geosynthetic, making the materials more accessible and affordable um, by removing the transport factor or the shipping factor, um, as well as the lead times. So as Africa continues to grow and develop, the role of geosynthetic materials is poised to become even more significant in shaping a sustainable and resilient future. I'd like to give um, special thanks to the following people who have contributed to this presentation. Um, Mr. Calvin Legg of the Department of Water and Sanitation here of, in South Africa, um, Debbie Wojtowicz for the Geofilm case study, um, George from Jones and Wagner in Ghana for the tailings facility study, um, um, Mr. Katari um, for some of the Morocco um, case studies, um, Hamza for the soft, so um, soft soil um, founding case study for the um, high speed railway. Um, development, Peter Hardy for the AKS Learning Systems History, um, Tyrone for the KTEC GCL um, contribution, Vian Fisser of Jan Palm Consulting um, for the hazardous case study in South Africa, and all the other African regional committees um, who contributed, and the IGS leadership um, overall for giving me this opportunity to showcase um, what the African region has um, achieved over the past 40 years together with the IGS. So in that, I would like to say thank you and to say happy 40th anniversary um, to the IGS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jabulili, indeed. It was um, a great, a great presentation and uh, a very deep insight on on the, this uh, very interesting and huge project, I would say. Um, I would like to encourage all the participants to um, interact with us and with Jabulili uh, by using the Q&A function. So please uh, send your comments, your question, if you have a curiosity. I, I really believe Jabulili is happy um, to interact with you. Um, yeah, maybe I I can start just an icebreaker with the curiosity I have myself. Um, I I was wondering, Jabulili, you in your career as a, as a designer, is there an a common a common challenging that you have to face in uh, in many projects? Um, like a common one. And then I'm not talking about the technical mm -hmm. one, <laughs> of course, but yeah. I really talk more about um, yeah, societal or other other particular challenging challenges. For example, I know some, some sites are difficult to access or uh, the acceptance of society, of the communities. I don't know, just uh, this was a curiosity I had. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, it's quite a broad question. Um, because there's many, <laughs> there are many challenges. Um, but I, I think related to maybe um, use of geosynthetic materials is, is just convincing um, people who have been um, stuck in their ways of using um, like traditional materials. And let's, let's talk about reinforcement as well. Um, a whole lot more is known about steel um, versus geogrid reinforcement, for example. Um, and without maybe um, case studies that have shown success um, over time and equivalence um, in terms of performance um, of, 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 of use of, of geogrids um, 
in, in, in reinforcement, for example, um, you'll find that clients um, will tend to just stick to the known um, because of a fear of um, failure, because of trying to explore new technologies. So I think it's just a matter of working together in terms of being able um, to prove a case um, and being able to access, um, even from outside of the African region, um, cases where structures have stood over years um, built with um, unconventional materials. So it's just changing perception um, of, 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 of long um, thought um, ideas or um, conventions. Well, great. This, uh, and I think this is a big opportunity then for the IGS uh, with um, its educational material and education program programs. Um, you yeah, Laura. I think one of the things um, that we need to maybe change our minds on is um, we tend to educate each other as practitioners better than we educate um, our clients. Um, and we, we need to change our advocacy in terms of reaching um, those who do not practice um, in the field on a day-to-day. -day. Um, we need to find out where we can reach them and, and how we can share this knowledge. Um, and yeah, so, so, so being more active outside of our learned engineering societies, um, but getting more involved um, in terms of the operational, um, whether it be um, conferences, et cetera, where we can start um, showcasing um, these studies. Yeah, you are you are really right. This is also in uh, one of our strategic goals, be influential, that Eduardo was mentioning um, just on Monday regarding having more uh, liaison and contact and interaction with other society that are yeah. um, not us. But um, I have to acknowledge that Kitsa is also one of the um, very, very... Um, yeah, active, active chapter yeah. and uh, um, is doing a, a good job also on that, for example. Ah, let, let's see. I had just right now um, a question for uh, from uh, Tsveli Malangu. I just uh, read it right now. Well done, Chairman. Very insightful. And it's good to see these projects being constructed in Africa that shows that Africa is indeed developing this was a comment i i would say right thank you israeli thank you for your comment um and again this has just been a glimpse um of but many other cases there's been um airport runways example nigeria um tanzania um a lot of um, mine case studies there in kenya um all over the african region almost every single um country um there is a case to 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 be told um unfortunately just time is not on our side and and hopefully it will be a nice project one day to be able to to list um all the various use in all the different um african um regions whether or not they have a um an igs chapter um i, I think it, it would be good for our ambassadors to 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 be aware of that information Okay. Um, is there any other question, curiosity, comment? I think all I can say is um, if there is a specific question relating to a case study, if there's um, some technical questions, please, you're, you're more than welcome to submit those um, either to um, Elise, IGS Secretary, um, who will then pass them on to me. And um, I would um, engage the designer or um, the person who submitted the case study um, if I'm not able to answer those directly. Uh, Jabulia, it's just see, is uh, one came in, um, it's from Anonymous, but it's an interesting one, um, is asking, um, are there any innovation that originated in Africa? Ooh. 
I can't say off the top of my head, um, but I would think um, with regards to filtration, um, there is a case study in terms of using earlier dams, uh, but I, I, I don't have that information off the top of my head. Um, but I, definitely one of the first uses was um, in um, dams and um, separating the core um, and the 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 the, the the chimney drains and the seepage drains. So I, I need to dig that up. <laughs> Great. No, I think if uh, we do not have any other question coming in, I would like also to uh, remind that Jabulile is um, the chair of the region, African and Middle East Regional Activity Committees. And um, so uh, I invite everyone uh, to get in contact with her, um, also to know what is gonna, uh, what are the, the new plans for the next year and um, yeah, to get more involved also within the IGS regional activities. And um, yeah, I really would like to uh, uh, thank you Jabulili uh, for uh, this great presentation and uh, to everyone who joined us today. Don't forget we have other lecture and webinar session in the coming two days. Tomorrow we will have the lecture of uh, Fumio Tatsuoka on geosynthetic reinforced soil structure for the last 40 years in Japan. And afterward, uh, there will be the Ask the Officer session with the last IGS president, Chang Sik Yu. Uh, you have uh, plenty of time to, to register, so don't forget um, to register to attend them. And um, with that, I, I would say thank you again, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you there. And bye-bye. Uh, thank you, Lara. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.